Let's talk about silence. Silence is one of the great arts of conversation. And I might even edit this to say one of the great lost arts of conversation. And in this video, I wanna share five really creative techniques that will enable you to capture and use and create productive silence. I'd invite you to uh, block out the time to fully watch this video because in it, I'm going to teach you how to read silence. It's gonna teach you how time warps a little bit and teach you some really practical ideas and techniques to use it to create conversations that really matter. Um, and it is amazing how with such little effort, you can really change the tone and narrative of conversation using silence. The first technique to create productive silence is start with it. When Will, Wise, my co-founder and I are being deliberate about meeting, we start every single meeting, and I'd say we start nine out of 10 meetings with at least 60 seconds of total silence. And I want you to do an exercise with me right now, even just as you're watching this. Um, sometimes we think 60 seconds feels like, oh, it's kind of uh, a lot of time sitting and doing nothing. It's not actually even 10 breaths. So I want you to, I'm gonna take a deep breath and I want you to take a deep breath with me and just count on the video thing, count the amount of seconds that go by in this breath. Did this last night for 10 breaths on a little stopwatch, and I averaged between seven and 10 seconds per breath. And the reason I invited us to do this is silence warps time. It changes our perception of time. So in a conversation, when three seconds of silence goes by, we're like, ah, I gotta fill the space, right? Whereas literally one breath, is seven to 10 seconds of silence. And so the uh, amount of space that that can create, and if you're familiar with Susan Cain's work, or the, her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, brilliant insights talking about how uh, some of the smartest, most wonderful inventions and people and ideas have come from uh, folks that have taken time in silence, who tend to sit alone and then bring their ideas and their gifts to the world. And she talks about uh, you know, uh, Rosa Parks and Gandhi and Buddha and all these uh, really phenomenal leaders in a group simply inviting a breath or 60 seconds of silence in the beginning can it allow uh, for people to let go of what was behind them, maybe take a pause from the worries of the future and just be really present in this moment, which is actually like the required necessary step for teleportation to be complete. Meaning when you all come to a meeting or a gathering or a conversation, you are not in the, even if you're literally in the same room or the same Zoom link, you are not in the same place because they're still where they were and you're still where you were. And so pausing just for seven breaths, 60 seconds or so, um, can allow people to arrive, doesn't take any uh, time and makes a meeting so much more deliberate and productive. And speaking of the word productive, let me uh, articulate out here. I think that um, the best way to avoid awkward silence is to create productive silence. The best way to avoid unproductive silence is to create productive silence, right? So sometimes as a, a leader or facilitator, we've asked a question, we've posed a response, we've requested ideas from the group or share outs, and we get crickets. When that happens, we start to label that silence as awkward or unproductive or too long, right? Almost always that silence isn't gonna last for more than five seconds, but we fill it in quick with like, okay, here's an example of this, or here's what I was thinking about, we jump in and we break that silence and we destroy one of the lost arts of conversation. So what would it look like to say, hey, I'm gonna ask you all to come up with an idea, but I'm gonna give 10 seconds of total silence for you to rewind the tape, think of what you wanna share. And when you've got it, just put a thumbs up or put your paper down or whatever else, signaling that you've got something and you're ready. That's productive silence. And so if you see people looking up like this or looking to the side, like they're thinking, let that silence roll for a little bit longer. Technique number two, I kind of just hinted on is you know, front loading silence. So before you give silence, tell people why you're giving them silence. Hey, I'm gonna leave 10 seconds of silence here so that 
and then fill in your intention there. Using silence as a conversational tool or a leadership or an educator tool takes a little bit of courage and it, because it requires you to silence some of the voices that start to show up in your head when there's too much silence or you're wondering uh, what's happening, which we'll get to that point uh, shortly about reading silence. But if you're gonna front load silence and say, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds or 20 seconds to think or a minute of total silence, you need to actually, as a leader of educator, I believe you need to actually stop people if they jump in early. And this happens in almost every group I facilitate. I'll invite people to popcorn out responses. I'll say, I'll give you 10 seconds to think um, before I invite, and somebody will be like, hear the question and they won't have heard of anything else I've said and they'll jump in. And part of me wants to just give them a hug and be like, oh, thanks for sharing. Um, but the other part of me wants to say, oh, I totally wanna hear your idea. You can absolutely go first, but pause. I wanna keep this next 20 seconds sacred to actually honor that silence. It'll build, build an immense amount of trust um, with a group because you've promised something and by keeping that promise, you're showing integrity um, to the group. It might create a little bit of a laugh, um, but you can. there's a lot of ways that you can uh, shut that person down lovingly without shutting them down. Right? Just like, oh, I cannot wait to hear what you have to say and I wanna give people just 10 more seconds so that everyone has a response before we poison the well. Because that's how group think shows up, right? You don't leave silence. The loudest person or the person who thinks the quickest or types the fastest gets their idea out first and then everybody else's brain is now warped and going down that path. Technique number three is like preventative. So if you wanna prevent a heart attack, exercise, right? So this is like the exercise of uh, silence and group engagement. Scaffold your engagement. So here's an example. Right after filming this video, I'm gonna be leading a workshop for the University of California, San Diego. 150 uh, staff and student leaders on how to make engagement easy. I could start off by saying, hey everybody, welcome. I wanna get right down to it. What is life teaching you right now? Can somebody unmute and share? It's like, whoa, that is, that's like throwing people right into the deep end uh, way too fast. And so scaffolding engagement looks like, I'm gonna ask them first, hey, what's one of your favorite conversation topics and can you put that in the chat? And can somebody ask a question about that? Uh, I'm building up to things so that uh, I'm stretching people's comfort zone, not just throwing them into the uh, deep end. Because when you throw people in the deep end and you ask a question like, uh, hey, I, I, you know, I trust you did the reading last night. What happened in 1812? That's throwing people in the deep end. If, you're, if you have silence with that type of a question, it's uh, because perhaps, well, perhaps they didn't do the reading, but perhaps uh, it didn't scaffold um, the engagement and build people up to that. The war of 1812 happened in 1812. Fourth creative technique has to do with uh, reading silence. And uh, how do you read silence? I have noticed for myself, um, after doing this a bajillion times with groups, that I tend to be wrong when I read silence. <laughs> in fact, I was just with a group of uh, faculty doing a faculty professional development workshop in Wichita, and uh, <laughs> I read on the group's faces, we were all organized in a circle for this workshop, I read on people's faces that they were kind of tuned out, not totally interested. And because we were talking about group engagement, I actually mentioned to them right now, hey, I, I wanna check in with you. I, I'm not sure the level of engagement that's happening right now. In fact, I was completely dead wrong. And this happens every, almost every single time. I misread the type of silence in the room. And so the technique here um, that I learned from uh, Will, my partner in crime, is this sentence. I don't know how to read your silence. And then guess what you do after saying that sentence? You let the silence sit a little bit, right? I don't know how to read your silence. Let that silence sit until somebody interprets it for you. If you really need to say something after it, you can say, I don't know how to read your silence. Can somebody help me interpret it? That takes some courage to do. That's a bit of a bold move as a facilitator or a leader, yet it can absolutely move a group beyond unproductive or awkward, uh, not useful silence. Last but absolutely not least, uh, flip roles. This technique can actually end up creating more silence, which will be uncomfortable for some people, but it is also a phenomenal tool to promote more inclusive work environments, more inclusive classes, and that is flipping roles. I might uh, practice one of the previous techniques and front load the silence to say, hey, I'm gonna ask everybody this question. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to think about your own response, maybe even write down a note if, uh, about something you wanna say on a sticky note or a piece of paper. And then I'm gonna invite you to share and popcorn out, uh, but I'd love for you to flip roles. If you tend to be the first person that speaks, go ahead and be the last person. 
or you tend to hold back uh, your opinion, I would love to hear your perspective. Can you jump in first, second, or third? And when you invite people to flip roles, you create and extend a little bit more silence because those more reticent people are gonna be more reticent to share first, second, or third. But the alternative is you only hear the loud extroverted people and you ignore some absolutely brilliant perspectives in the group that aren't gonna get heard because they get clamored down by the louder extroverted people. Now with most of us, there's an irony of our own expertise. Silence, after this whole video, is probably my biggest weakness, right? It's probably the thing that I need to work on most. And so I love, as a call to action for this video, to drop down in the comments and leave an idea or an experience of how to create productive silence. A sixth creative technique or concept um, that you might add. And the idea is that the longer this video lives on the internet, the more valuable the comments thread will be. If you've got nothing, but you're trying to cultivate more productive silence for yourself, you might really enjoy this brand new guided journal that we just printed and created um, that's intended to help you skip the small talk and create conversations that matter. You can check that out in the link in the description. I'm Chad Littlefield, have an awesome day.